there, I'm Natalie Haynes, and I wrote this book, Pandora's Jar, and also these books, Children of Jocasta and A Thousand Ships, and I am in Daunt, in Marylebone High Street. Um, and I thought I would talk to you a little bit about Pandora and why she has a jar in my version of, uh, of this book, um, for the excellent reason that Pandora doesn't have a box until Erasmus, and that is pretty well 2,000 years after her story begins. So. Uh, we think of Pandora, obviously, as having a box, opening it, and letting all the evils in the world out into the world. And that is simply not an accurate depiction of how she's uh, portrayed to us in the ancient world. So we have two accounts about Pandora in the work of Hesiod. One in his Theogony, his story of how the gods uh, were born and created. Um, and a slightly longer one in his poem Works and Days, which is really difficult um, poem to describe in terms of genre. It's basically a sort of passive-aggressive rant at his brother, um, masquerading as a farming advice handbook. It's quite an unlikely poem. I'm not saying this is a genre that's particularly caught off since Hesiod. I'm just saying that's what it is. Um, in the version of Pandora that we have in the Theogony, it's quite short and we're told that um, she's created at the behest of Zeus, king of the gods, um, because uh, he wants to and then this is where the translation gets a bit trickier. He wants to pay us back for, pay mortals back for, or set something in exchange for fire. We didn't used to have fire. And then um, Prometheus, a uh, titan, steals fire from the gods and gives it to mortals. And this obviously improves our lot, no end. Raw food, boring, I do see raw food enthusiasts that you probably feel differently. There's a limit to how many crudite a person can eat in the average day, in my experience. Um, so Prometheus steals fire for us. And the penalty for that, or the exchange for that, is Pandora, um, who is created by the god Hephaestus, the blacksmith god, um, and she is um, contributed to, let's say, by a bunch of other gods and goddesses who all come to help her out with you know, everything down to her dress. Is uh, She's equipped by other gods. Um, and then she is sent to mortals in order to um, cause us all kinds of trouble. And so what happens, of course, to Pandora's story is that it's mapped onto the story of Eve, the Old Testament story of Eve as time goes on. Uh, obviously not uh, for quite a while after Hesiod, but eventually she gets mapped onto the Eve narrative of beautiful woman does bad thing and makes everything difficult for everyone. Um, I'm so glad it's that fault. I always hope it will be. But what you have to remember is that for the ancients, Pandora is absolutely not a villain in the way that she's become uh, in the couple of thousand years since. She is much more complicated than that. She is a, an agent of change, but she's the embodiment, the literal embodiment of the will of Zeus. Zeus is trying to um, shake things up, I suppose, and that's what Pandora is. Um, Hesiod calls her a Kalon Kakon, which is almost always translated as a beautiful evil. But here's the thing, those two words, Kalon and Kakon, are opposites and they're adjectives being used um, sometimes with the article, the word the in Greek, you can use an adjective as a noun. So it's almost always translated as beautiful evil, but kalon means beautiful, fine, good, and kakon means the opposite, ugly, shoddy, bad. There's absolutely no reason at all why one of those terms should be visual, beautiful, and one should be moral, evil, and if there is, there's no reason why it should be that way around. Pandora could be an ugly good, we assume she isn't, because we're told that the gods make her beautiful, but she could just as well be beautiful ugly, jolly led is the French, why not? Um, it's just that we're so used to a beautiful woman being a bad thing that we've decided that's what she must be, and I at least have a slight problem with that. I also have a problem with how her story has been simplified and then mistranslated. Um, Let's go with the mistranslation first. Erasmus is responsible for this. He takes the word pithos in Greek when he translates Hesiod into Latin, and he converts it to the word pixis, uh, which is Latin pithos, jar, pixis, box. And that's how the story of Pandora changes. And that sounds really simplistic, but it is really just a couple of decades after Erasmus that you start seeing paintings with Pandora for the first time shown with a box. And, you know, sometimes it's like a strong box with straps over it, so it looks like she's really going to have to make an effort to let all these evils out into the world. But, you know, quite a lot of times it's, you know, slightly smaller. She is never, Pandora is literally never shown with any sort of receptacle in any form of ancient art whatsoever. No sculpture, no vase painting ever shows Pandora with any kind, not with a jar, not with a box, not anything. She is always shown in the act of being created. For the ancients, Pandora's primary role in myth is to be 
our ancestor, women's ancestor. Men are descended from Erichthonius, women from Pandora. We're literally different races, according to the Greek origin story. Um, but Pandora is, is never shown. This is not the important thing about her. For us, it's become it because of Erasmus, but not to the ancients. Like I say, in the first version of her story in Theogony, she has no receptacle at all. It's only in the second version in Works and Days that she appears on the doorstep of Epimetheus, brother of Prometheus, who, by the way, has been warned by his brother not to accept any gifts from Zeus and literally four seconds later goes, oh, come on in. Right. <laughs> so Prometheus, by the way, means foresight. Epimetheus means hindsight, just in case you were hoping that Dickens was the person who invented the name which tells you everything about a character. No, there you go, Hesiodkin. Uh, coming ahead of you, although I doubt he invented the names either, truthfully. And so, Pandora is sometimes shown with a jar in the ancient world, but never with a box. That is entirely the invention of, of Erasmus. Um, the scholar M.L. West, I think, said that uh, perhaps Erasmus had confused the stories of Pandora and Psyche. Psyche, um, out of Cupid and Psyche, does have a box. It doesn't have all the world's evils in it, but she does have a box. Did he mix them up or did he just mix up the two words, pithos, pixis? They are pretty close. Um, it's hard to say, but it does change everything. I should say, by the way, in case you're thinking this is just a gendered issue, it's not. Erasmus has massive form for doing this. So, for example, we sometimes say in idiomatic English um, that somebody who's unusually blunt likes to call a spade a spade, and that comes from Erasmus. And it is another mistranslation from the Greek because the word scaphe, which he carefully translates as spade, actually means canoe. So what we should say is that somebody unusually blunt likes to call a canoe a canoe, which, to be honest, is both more fun to say and generally more unusual and entertaining. But there you go. You can rely on Erasmus, I'm afraid, to screw this one up for all of us, which is just the way it goes. So um, Pandora is not, in the first instance, possessing a box. Uh, she is only sometimes, in the ancient world, possessing a jar, as I say, never in visual art. Um, and perhaps one more thing about her that we have to bear in mind is that she is only sometimes responsible for the jar being opened. Firstly, let's you know just deal with the basic logistics of a jar. A box, you have to really make an effort to open, right? It's square, it's got a solid base, you've got to really open the lid of a box to let things out. But a jar, you've been to a museum, you've seen the state of those Greek jars. In Greece and Italy, where they have earthquakes, they're usually you know, strung round and then attached to the walls of museums because they're so unstable. They've got really narrow bases and then really fat tops. They're really easy to knock over. Don't put all the world's evils in that. That's an absolutely terrible idea. In some versions of her story, uh, Pandora opens the jar. In some versions, Epimetheus, her husband, opens the jar. And that's what happens in the version told, or a version told by Aesop, whose fables we probably all read as children. In some versions of her story, um, the jar is full of good things. That's what happens in the version that we have in Theognis, for example. But these versions all get lost over time because we're so determined to have a narrative in which beautiful woman does terrible thing and makes everything worse for everyone is the story that we're aiming for. Um, one thing that is consistent across the versions of Pandora's story, though, is that no matter whether the things in the jar are good and, or bad, um, one thing remains in the jar after it's been opened, and that is Elpis, uh, which is usually translated as hope, um, but a more accurate translation would be expectation. Um, it doesn't necessarily in Greek contain the um, suggestion that the thing you're waiting for is a good thing. Uh, so you're expecting something to happen, but it's not necessarily good. But then this opens up a whole new can of worms, although not a Pandora's box. Uh, this opens a whole new can of worms because is it a good thing or a bad thing that hope is retained in the jar? Here's the thing. If the jar is full of bad things and bad things then exit into the world everywhere and hope is retained in the jar under its lip, which is what usually happens, then is it good that we still have hope because it's safe in our jar? Or is it bad because all these terrible things are out in the world and hope isn't among them? to spread itself amongst us. If it's good things that are in the jar, is it bad that hope has been retained there? Or is it, this is a genuinely difficult philosophical question to answer. No wonder it's easier to just say, oh, a pretty woman did it, it's her fault, blame her. You can see how these things, you know, could happen. Um, Pandora is only one of 10 women in this book. I should definitely know who these are by now because I've made a video about every single one of them. So they are, wait, 
Pandora, Jocasta, obviously the, uh, I don't know how much I want to spoil my own novel, which is there. Let's go with Wife of Oedipus. Um, Helen of Troy, as we know her, but Helen of Sparta, as she starts out, obviously it will be a much shorter war. You can read about her in A Thousand Ships if you'd like to. Um, Medusa, um, the Amazons, uh, including uh, Hippolyta and Penthesilea. Penthesilea, in case you're wondering, also a star of A Thousand Ships. Um, is the inventor of the fighting axe, the double-headed fighting axe, we're told by Pliny the Elder, uh, which always makes me happy. What a thing to have invented. That's a proper warrior. Um, Eurydice, um, we know her best as the wife of Orpheus, but uh, her name doesn't appear. Their story doesn't appear until really late in Greek myth, and her name doesn't appear until the 2nd century, I think, BC, so she's a very late addition to uh, myth. Phaedra, the uh, wife of Theseus, one of the many many, many wives of Theseus, uh, Medea, uh, Penelope, and Clytemnestra. So there are some, the actual worst wife, uh, Clytemnestra, who obviously kills her husband with sometimes an axe, sometimes a sword. Apparently the detail isn't that important if you're on the receiving end of it. Uh, Medea, famously regarded as the worst mother in all of Greek myth. Uh, Penelope, the best wife. I'm always very suspicious when somebody holds up a woman as a paragon of virtue. Uh, wondering what their what their game is. I'm a very suspicious person by nature. Um, and I decided that uh, Penelope should get a chapter in this book because it's just as constraining in lots of ways to be held up as the perfect woman uh, as it is to be held up as the absolute worst woman. Uh, so it was too tempting to do her too. Um, I thought I would read you a tiny bit from the introduction. Um, I'm not sure whose signed copy this is that I'm reading from, uh, but... Rest assured, I'm doing it really carefully. I used to work in a bookshop, so I am highly trained um, to turn the pages and not damage the spine. So you'll never know that this was me. It'll look completely unblemished uh, when you get it. So good to know. Although it is quite rainy outside. I've got a slightly damp leg, just so you know. So I'm just making sure that this isn't resting on my slightly damp leg, because then you'll have a little bit of a ruck in the paper. And unless you read it in the bar, you will know that it was me. But good news, there are some signed copies that were signed... Uh, pre, this is a small bit of backstage detail for you, uh, that was signed before publication where I signed sheets of paper because we couldn't get into warehouses and sign actual books this time. Um, and uh, I, so I had to sign a whole ream, a bunch of reams of paper, about two and a half thousand copies, I think. Um, and I was doing them while watching, I'm not going to lie to you, everyone, Murder, She Wrote, because that's ideal, uh, signing material. <laughs> and uh, it makes you feel really successful compared with Jessica Fletcher, and who doesn't want that? And then, unfortunately for me, it took so long to do it that they took me right the way through into Paddington 2. And obviously I started to cry <laughs> because it's Paddington 2. So three of those books, I think, have got little tear stains on the side page. Not because anything bad happened, but because I got emotional about Paddington. Just so you know, a little bit of backstage detail for you there. You're welcome. Anyway, everyone, let's stop being silly. Uh, that would mainly be me and talk about a very serious Greek myth. When Harry Hamlin stood behind a pillar in the darkness of Medusa's lair in the Ray Harryhausen film, Clash of the Titans, flames flickering off his shield, his face glistening with sweat, my brother and I were transfixed. Perseus holds the shield in front of his eyes to protect himself from Medusa's stony gaze. He watches the reflection of a slithering monster outlined in front of the fire behind him. This Medusa has a lashing, snakish tail, as well as the traditional snakes for hair. She is armed with a bow and arrows and can knock one of Perseus's comrades off his feet with a single hit. As the man sprawls on the ground, she glides forward into the light. Suddenly her eyes flash bright green. He is turned to stone where he lies. Medusa fires another arrow, this time taking Perseus's shield out of his hands. Her rattlesnake tail quivers in anticipation of the kill. Perseus tries to catch her reflection in the glinting blade of his sword as she knocks a third arrow. Medusa inches closer as Perseus waits, turning his sword in his hand. The sweat has formed beads across his upper lip. At the crucial moment, he swings his arm and decapitates her. Her body writhes before thick red blood seeps out from her neck. When it reaches his shield, there is a hissing sound as it corrodes the metal. This film, along with Jason and the Argonauts, was a staple of my childhood viewing. It was a rare school holiday when one of them wasn't on TV. It did not occur to me that there was anything unusual about the depiction of Medusa because she wasn't a character, she was just a monster. Who feels sorry for a creature who has snakes for hair and turns innocent men to stone? 
I would go on to study Greek at school because of these films, and probably also because of the children's versions of Greek myths I had read, a Puffin edition, I think, by Roger Lancelin Green. My brother tells me we had a Norse one too. It would be years before I came across any other version of Medusa's story, anything that told me how she became a monster or why. During my degree, I kept coming across details in the work of ancient authors which were quite different from the versions I knew from simplified stories I'd read and watched. Medusa wasn't always a monster. Helen of Troy wasn't always an adulterer. Pandora wasn't ever a villain. Even characters that were outright villainous, Medea, Clytemnestra, Phaedra, were often far more nuanced than they first appeared. In my final year at college, I wrote my dissertation on women who kill children in Greek tragedy. I have spent the last few years writing novels which tell stories from Greek myth that have largely been forgotten. Female characters were often central figures in ancient versions of these stories. The playwright Euripides wrote eight tragedies about the Trojan War which survive to us today. One of them, Orestes, has a male title character. The other seven have women as their titles. Andromache, Electra, Hecabe, Helen, Iphigenia and Alice, Iphigenia among the Taurians, and the Trojan women. When I began hunting out the stories I wanted to tell, I felt exactly like Perseus in the Harryhausen movie, squinting at reflections in the half-light. These women were hiding in plain sight in the pages of Ovid and Euripides. They were painted on vases which are held in museums all over the world. They were in fragments of lost poems and broken statues, but they were there. It was, however, while debating the character of a non-Greek woman that I decided to write this book. I was on Radio 3 discussing the role of Dido, the Phoenician queen who founded the city of Carthage. To me, Dido was a tragic heroine, self-denying, courageous, heartbroken. To my interviewer, she was a vicious schemer. I was responding to her in Virgil's Aeneid. He was responding to her in Marlowe's Dido, Queen of Carthage. I'd spent so long thinking about ancient sources. I'd forgotten that most people get their classics from much more modern sources. Marlowe is modern to classicists. Dismal though I think the film Troy to be, for example, it has probably been seen by more people than have read the Iliad. So I decided I would choose 10 women whose stories have been told and retold in paintings, plays, films, operas, musicals and more, and I would show how differently they were viewed in the ancient world. How major female characters in Ovid would become non-existent Hollywood wives in 21st century cinema. How artists would recreate Helen to reflect the ideals of beauty of their own time, and we would lose track of the clever, funny, sometimes frightening woman that she is in Homer and Euripides, and how some modern artists and writers were finding these women, just like I was, and putting them back at the heart of the story. Every myth contains multiple timelines within itself, the time in which it is set, the time it is first told, and every retelling afterwards. Myths may be the home of the miraculous, but they are also mirrors of us. Which version of a story we choose to tell, which characters we place in the foreground, which ones we allowed to fade into the shadows, these reflect both the teller and the reader as much as they show the characters of the myth. We have made space in our storytelling to rediscover women who have been lost or forgotten. They are not villains, victims, wives and monsters. They are people. Thank you so much. <laughs>